And just notice that uh, for some reason or another, the computer was off under the, the platform here, so we weren't streaming. So that's why I was over here playing with my iPad. Not always do you, and I try not to do that. But anyway, all right, so uh, looks, like, looks like we may be going now. All right, well, this morning, good morning, everyone. Hey, Nolan, could you grab me one of those too, please? Thank you. Uh, all right, so uh, this morning, do pray for Brother Barker. You've got me this morning. Brother Barker is preaching. Brother Bolin and I were trying to remember where he said he was preaching, but I can't. Uh, he's preaching at a church today, filling a pulpit. So uh, do, uh, do pray for him and his wife and grandma as they, uh, as, uh, as they uh, travel. We will be in the book of Jonah today. If you do not have one of those printouts, uh, Brother Jaime, okay, good. Uh, make sure you get one of those. Uh, all right, so this morning, uh, Miss Renee at, said that she was excited that I was getting the whiteboard out. Um, sometimes we do a stump the preacher, so uh, we're going to try that this morning. As long as you don't ask any hard questions, uh, we'll spend a few moments doing that. But let's, let's open up in a word of prayer. Uh, I think Evan already did, but let's, let's have another word of prayer. We're going to spend a little extra time in prayer today. I've got kind of on my heart just the uh, state of our country, just things that are going on. I know that there's people fighting in our nation's capital, fighting, actual fights based upon, I mean, this is what you would call political violence. People fighting based upon what they believe in politics. So we're gonna spend a little extra time today, uh, Lord, just put it on my heart, in for praying for our nation. So let's, let's do that right now. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for everybody here uh, in Sunday school. But Lord, I also ask that you would just be, be with us Lord, through our services, and be with our country, Lord. Lord, it's just horrendous. It's shocking, uh, the things that are being done in the name of politics. And Lord, on both sides, there was a time in our lives when, uh, not too long ago, when the American political system would not have gone to this state. And Father, I do pray that you would forgive us, Lord. We ask you, uh, Lord, to... I know many people are asking you to heal, their, heal our land, but Father, I ask, Lord, that you would cause us to repent because, Lord, that is uh, the, the precursor of your healing. We should turn from our wicked ways, and Lord, and repent. And then you will heal our land. And Father, we ask for that. We, we, ask, we look to ourselves. We look to the people that we can affect, Lord, that we should give the gospel to. We ask all these things in Jesus' name this morning. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, this morning, so Miss Renee said she had a question. Oh, oh, she said she had a doozy. Okay, so, all right, so we're, this is the stump the preacher. Uh, I only accept easy questions, though. Does anybody have an easy question? Nobody? We had a... a the gap theory. And oh, the gap theory. Okay, I, I think I can do that. Uh, okay, so gap theory. It has nothing to do with a clothing store. Just going to point that out first. That's not at the mall. It's, it's actually the gap theory as far as evolution. Now, there are a couple of different primary theories about the book of Genesis, particularly the first uh, three, four, five chapters of Genesis dealing with creation. Uh, creation is a problem for some people because they want to try to reconcile the book of Genesis with what uh, supposed scientists, or what they call science, pseudoscience, or science so-called, falsely so-called, claims in evolution. So I think the most, most of what you hear, like the day-age theory and the gap theory, uh, comes from this uh, attempt to reconcile what God says in his word with what scientists tell us about fossil records and things like that. So the first thing is that most of these are uh, attempts to reconcile these things. So there's two primary, well, there's many, there's many ways. There's God's way, and then there's all the other ways that the world has come up with to try to explain how everything got here. 
So the first thing is that you have to understand in all of this that there must be a beginning point. Now this is just, this is a little outside the gap theory, but there has to be a point where things begin. There's a reason for that. Because if the past were actually not a have a beginning, if the past were infinite, then we'd never get out of the past. There can be no present if the past is infinite. The past takes up all the area, all the space. If the past is infinite, we can't be in the present. It's, it, you can't have an infinite past. You've got to have a beginning point somewhere. So you've got a beginning point somewhere, and any time you have a beginning or a point where something begins, you have to have a cause. All things happen because of cause. Now, the question for most evolutionists is what caused that? They would say the Big Bang. Well, what happened before that? They say, well, it was a collapse in a previous Big Bang, and that just goes on infinitely. Well, you can't logically have that. But let's say they said the Big Bang. Well, the Big Bang creates this thing of, of this universe, theoretically, of, of matter, space, and time. None of those things existed before then. Um, and it expands out and supposedly expands out and billions and billions of years ago that kind of coalesce around stars and then planets coalesce and then life somehow from non-animate, non-living matter, life somehow begins and then millions of years later, here are you and I. Not from monkeys. Uh, don't, don't, don't let somebody trap you by that. They'll say, well, you think that man came from monkeys. No, no, uh, or, or the evolutionists. Christians claim that evolutionists believe that man comes from monkeys. That's not true. Uh, we don't. If you've studied evolution, that's not what they claim. But here's the point. In all, let me put it this way. Every religion has to have a creation epic. Every religion does. If you look at Hindus, the world is sitting on four turtles and something like that. And it's, you know, if you talk to, uh, if you talk to uh, the Muslims, it has certain things. I mean, the Jews don't actually believe uh, Genesis anymore, most of them. Uh, but every religion has something to describe creation. I've talked about Norse mythology before. You know, Odin created himself. He and Frida just popped out of nothing. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, but they have a creation ethic or epic. Secular humanism is a religion. It has a priestly class. They call them psychologists. And secular humanism also has a creation epic. It's called evolution. It is a religious view. So my point in all of this, to describe all of this, is if you are trying to reconcile evolution with the Bible, it's never going to work out right. You're trying to reconcile two religious viewpoints. Now, I was asked the other day on the internet whether I was a six-day literal creationist, and I said, yes, because no other position makes any logical sense to me. If I didn't believe the world was created in six literal 24-hour days, then I would just believe in evolution, because there's, I don't believe that there's a point in between, and here's why. If this gap theory, which basically says and, and there's, a different, there's different definitions of this. I'm going to tell you the one that I believe that most people think of when they say gap is that, that there is, you know, God created things here, and then there's this great big gap, and then there's something else where he created, you know, planets, and then there's this great big gap of millions of years, and then suddenly you've got people. Does that make sense? Is that what you were thinking of? Well, when you said, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth, and the earth was without form and void. Right. Is that what they Yes. Okay. Yeah, and so when you try to plug that in there, and then there's, then there's the, so there's the evolutionary standpoint of that, where they say, well, that's what, we're, we're all the creation, and the stars are formed, and all the other things happens, and planets cool off, and in these gaps. 
And then you go fast forward millions or billions of years, and then God created the animals or, you know, that kind of stuff. Now, there's also a religious viewpoint where there's this God created everything, and then there's this great big gap where all kinds of crazy things happen, and that's where, you know, there's other people being created, and the Mormons talk about that sometimes, and there's different life forms being created, and other races and other civilizations before man, and the Bible doesn't talk about any of that stuff. So that's all pure imagination. But from the creationistic aspect, the gap theory, uh, from evolution standpoint is that they're basically are saying there's an unknown amount of time between the verses of Genesis. So between God created this, then there's this unknown period of time, and then God did that. Um, so that's one viewpoint, the day-age theory. Uh, there's, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. They say, well, days must last longer with God, therefore a day of creation can be billions of years. Another problem with all of these is that that makes, a, that makes God a failure. That God cannot create a good, perfect creation without a lot of failure and trial and error in between. Because that's what evolution would be if God did it. It'd be trial and error. I'm going to try these amoebas. Well, that didn't work. I'm going to try these trilobites. Well, that did work. I'm going to try these dinosaurs. Well, that didn't work. I'm going to try these Cro-Magnon men. Well, that didn't work until God finally hit upon the right design. That's not the God that I serve. He is all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful. You can't have an all-powerful, all-knowing, omniscient God who has to create things through trial and error. It just, those two things don't work together. Am I answering your question? Am I getting there? All right. Uh, that's a good question, though, because I just updated our missionary questionnaire and put it, on the, uh, put it on our website so I could send the secret link to uh, missionaries who call me. And that's one of the questions. What do you believe on the subject of creation? And it's just a multiple choice. Six literal days, gap theory, day-age theory, or... Uh, I think, I think the fourth one is theistic evolution. There's only one real answer, and that's six literal days, because that's what the Bible says. The Bible talks about that. If you look at the Hebrew, it is a day, a 24-hour period. You can't get away from it. People try, but you can't. Good question. Other questions? Anybody else got another one? Okay. Amen. Well, nobody, okay, I've got one. I'll add this to you. Okay, so this is not, this, this, is, this is something that I find interesting. This is not a, uh, a day is, is, is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, right? The Bible says that. Well, there's been about 6,000 years since creation. Six to 10,000 years, depending on how you add up the genealogies. I've heard, I've heard people say as many as 10,000 years. Most people say it's been about 6,000. So, you've got 6,000 years divided up, you've got 4,000 years to the time of the cross, you've got 2,000 years, obviously, to today. Now, it's interesting that God, when he created, he said, let there be light. That's from the very beginning. He gave us his word from the very beginning. He gave us his light, his knowledge, his wisdom. Adam and Eve had everything they needed in order to not sin. They made the choice to sin. They were not bound to sin. They were not ignorant of their sin. God gave them, to my knowledge, one specific command, dress, well, to dress and keep the garden and don't eat of the tree. They disobeyed the prescriptive command, don't eat of the tree. Well, about 4,000 years ago, and then there was Jesus Christ. It's interesting that the sun, actual S-U-N, a light source, was created on day four. So if you have four days of creation, the sun, actually the moon, the light sources were created on there. And then you've got two more days of creation uh, that kind of map out. And then the Bible tells us that there's a thousand-year millennial reign of Christ after the time of the tribulation, which would be like a day of rest. 
said, I don't think that means anything. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hang my head on this. I just think it's interesting. I just think it's interesting. Be that as it may. All right. Let's go to the book of Jonah. Book of Jonah, everybody's got your uh, Sunday school lessons there, I hope. I hesitate to, to talk about that kind of stuff because they're like, oh, you're trying to set dates. I'm like, I'm not setting any dates. I'm just saying I think it's interesting. That doesn't mean I know any dates. So the book of Jonah, uh, as if, if, you've, uh, if you've kind of followed along, Brother Barker has been doing this survey of Sunday, uh, in Sunday school, a survey of the Old Testament of the Bible, and he's doing basically a week per book, which is hard to do. Uh, but uh, you will see that he's about, looks like about three quarters of the way through. Um, when he gets into the minor prophets, Daniel, Hosea, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. So there's about, uh, looks like about seven or eight left. So anyway, um, thought that was interesting. So Jonah, the book of Jonah. Now, the, uh, one of my favorite stories about the book of Jonah is uh, from Brother Fred Moore. He, uh, he always uh, told us the story about how he, was, he had a uh, little, he had a little uh, mouse trap on his desk he, when he was a pastor up in Michigan. He also had a Christian school, and he had a little mouse trap on his desk with a little uh, 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 fake mouse, a little, little stuffed mouse, a little, little uh, figurine mouse that was caught in the mouse trap. He had that made into a little plaque on his desk as the principal of the Christian school. He had that on his desk, the mouse in the mouse trap, and he had that verse from Jonah, so he paid the fare thereof. That was, that was the way he liked to have the kids come into his office when they were in trouble, and he, they, see, they see that mouse in that mouse trap. But that's one of the key verses here in the book of Jonah, so he paid the fare thereof. I mean, Jonah, he got uh, kind of what he, was, what he uh, deserved. All right, so... Jonah, the Bible here, or the book of Jonah, Brother Barker's lesson, he says the theme is a commission from God. Key verse here, verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Now, he's got a little section there, but I, I think that it's interesting here when we talk about, or when we hear the words, um, their wickedness is come up before me. I, I think about this verse a lot, to be uh, perfectly honest with you, how uh, their wickedness has come up to where God is ready to destroy the city. The wickedness has come up to the place where God can no longer stomach it, if you will. He can no longer countenance the wickedness of this great city, Nineveh. He can't take it anymore, and, and I've likened it before, um, have you ever had something just kind of, kind of a little buzzing sound or something like that? Some little machine or some little piece of equipment or something in your house is making a little beep, and you're like, oh, or, or a smoke detector. Oh, those things are the worst. Why do they always lose their battery power at two o'clock in the morning? Can somebody tell me that? It, it can't it wait until morning just a little bit longer? But no, it always starts going beep beep, and you're like. And if you've got more than one smoke detector in your house, those things are hard to locate. Because here's what happens. They beep about every 20 seconds. So you're like, oh, OK. And you take it a couple more steps. And you get down the hallway sometime. And there's some in the bedrooms. And you're like, all right, which one is it? And you don't know because it's annoying, right? But you can't take it anymore. You've got to do something. Uh, that's annoying. That's frustrating. But I was telling you once upon the time of uh, an office that I was working in and the fire alarm, there was a problem with the fire alarm system and the fire alarm starts going off. And inside a commercial building, those fire alarms are so loud. They hurt your hearing. They're so loud. You can't possibly miss that. There was no fire and we had work to do. So we were sitting in this office trying to do work with this fire alarm going off. Ah, da, 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 da. I mean, just ear-poundingly loud. And so we're sitting there trying to do work. We couldn't do it. You could not concentrate on your work 
because of the sound of the fire alarm. And so when I read verse 2 in the book of Jonah, of chapter 1 in Jonah, that's, that's the picture I get where God is taken to a place because of the wickedness of Nineveh that he could no longer allow them any more mercy, I guess. I mean, he, he is ready to take action. But in one last-ditch effort, one final chance, he sends the preacher Jonah to Nineveh. He says, go up to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Why? Because their wickedness has come up before him. It's no longer, he can no longer allow it to pass. He's got to judge sin. And I think one of the instrumental factors of understanding the book of Jonah is you've got to understand that God must judge sin. It is in his nature to judge sin. He must judge sin. The books must balance. Now, I'm not saying that God, all the other aspects of God are not true, that God of absolutely, God is love. God has mercy. God allows us grace, but one of the facts of the matter is that God is a God that must judge sin. Now, the reason why we know that is Shouldn't have put that away. I can tell you in one word. Actually, usually we write it as three words. That God is holy. He cannot allow sin to abide. And nothing escapes his notice. He can't allow it. He can't allow it. And that's why Jesus Christ had to go to the cross because that's how he reconciles his love with us with the, pact of the, factor, the, the part of his nature that must judge sin. He loves us. He wants to make a way of escape for us. That's why he went to the cross. But he still must judge sin. That's why he took our place and accepted the judgment upon himself. If you're saved, that's what happened. He took the judgment. Sin must be judged because of God's holy nature. Jesus took that judgment upon himself for you and for me. That's... that's that's the effect of salvation, is he made a way of escape. But sin must be judged. Now people say, I don't see mercy in the Old Testament. Mercy is all over the Old Testament. All over the Old Testament. The book of Jonah, example, exhibit one. Exhibit number one, for the case of mercy being all over the Old Testament. Mercy and grace. God did not, this was a wicked, pagan city. One of the capitals of the Assyrian Empire. I mean, this is a city where the military ran upon, basically, like locusts. The military was almost like a side business. They, would, they, they didn't attack other cities for political reasons. They attacked them purely for money. It was purely mercenary, and they made no bones about it. They would actually sustain their economy by going and surrounding another city and attacking them. And they were merciless. They say, you come out, we will kill all your leaders because that's what we do. But we'll take your city and take all your stuff and put you in slaves. But if you make us come in, we'll kill you all. In horrible ways, and they did. You know what most cities did? They surrendered. This was a wicked, pagan nation. And Nineveh was one of their capital cities. Nineveh was a horrible city. And the Jews knew it too. When Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, there was a reason why he went the other direction because he didn't want God to be merciful to Nineveh. That's the thing. That's what you got to get your head around. Jonah knew as a preacher that God is a merciful God. Jonah knew as a preacher that God must, in his holiness, judge sin. And he also knew that if he went and preached in Nineveh, there was a chance that Nineveh would repent. Now, and I got I to gotta imagine for myself that Jonah wouldn't have had to think that it was a big chance. 
I mean, can you imagine thinking to yourself, well, I'm such a great preacher that if I go into this wicked city and just say God loves you, that everybody's going to turn to God. He couldn't have thought that. But on the other hand, he's thinking, there's a chance. And if I go and preach, they'll repent, God will spare them, and I hate these people because they've killed so many other cities. They're so wicked. They're so ungodly. Okay. So that's the picture. That's where we get started. Everybody wants to talk about Jonah and the great fish, Jonah and the whale, but the reality is <clears throat> the nuts and bolts of the story come from the fact that this preacher, this man of God, got the commission from God to do something and decided instead to take matters into his own hands. That's where you get to the great fish. That's where you get to all of these things is the fact that this preacher decided to go the wrong way. Now, Jesus Christ, by the way, there's, there's all kinds of, if you want to look at critical, at people who are critical of the Bible, these higher critics, they want to talk about Jonah being a, a nothing but a, a, a story, an example, a fable. Jesus Christ himself confirmed jo the book of Jonah he mentioned him in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 through 41. Brother Barker has that down there. So these are, and he talks about the, his preservation in the great fish. Jesus Christ verifies everything about it. And of course, the most important thing that Jesus Christ says there in Matthew is that as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, the belly of the great fish, for three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. And that's very important to us because that details the resurrection. So, um, the subject of this book is, according to Graham Scroggy, not a whale, but foreign missions. Other than the fact that we know about this story of Jonah, we don't know much about else about him. But we do know that his name means dove and his ministry to Nineveh was certainly spirit anointed. Uh, he's mentioned in 2 Kings 14. And you can go down through this look that Jonah, the book of Jonah is viciously attacked by, liber, liber, uh, by uh, liberal critics. Um, so let's take a look here and see. It's a very short book, so let's go ahead and see what we can get through here. All right, so the very first thing is we see, we see Joah, Jonah. We found out who he's fr where he's, his name. And the Bible says here, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And then verse 3, very early on, you know, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the saying goes, if you want to write fiction, if you, want to, if you want to tell a story, is you begin with the fist to the nose. You know, that's how you make an exciting story. You get somebody's interest right there. You don't start talking about all the people, but you begin with the fist to the nose. You, 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 you start with the fight scene or something like that. That's what the sales are. Well, God here, he does the same thing. I mean, it's verse 3. We see Jonah, and verse 3 begins with a three-letter word that usually means trouble. What's that three-letter word? But. God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh, but Jonah went the other direction. Let's, let's look at that. Verse number 3. But, jo but the Lord, oh, excuse me, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish, Tarshish, which is the opposite direction from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. There he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof. That's Brother Moore's little mouse, uh, paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, it's interesting, the lies we tell ourselves, Jonah, who knew God was holy, who knew God must judge, who knew the mercies of God, all of these things, he's running from God, and yet he's telling himself, I can run from the presence of the Lord. That he could get away from God, that he could, get, that he could escape God's notice by going to Tarshish. Verse number four, and we see another very critical verse that also begins with the word, but... But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so the ship was light to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. 
So the shipmaster came to him and said to him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us, and that we perish not. They said, Every one of two his fellow, Come, let us cast knots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? What people art, of what people art thou? He says unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, and he that made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and they said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Now, the story goes on. They say, well, you've got you've to feel a little bit for these mariners, these, these sailors on this ship. I mean, they were pagan men. They didn't know God. And the problem here, and this happens to us too, the problem is that none of the sailors on this ship knew that Jonah was a preacher. None of them knew that he knew the Lord. That's a problem. That's a problem. Do people know that we know the Lord? Do we go undercover in places? Are we secret agents for Jesus? Are we undercover wherever we go so that no one can sniff us out? I mean, Jonah went down inside the ship. He was asleep. He was comfortable. He was secure in God. He was confident that he was saved, that he was okay. He was asleep. It's those lost people around him that he didn't even bother to tell that he knew the Lord, they were the ones that were afraid. They were the ones that he could have helped, but he didn't. They said, what do you mean by sleeping? What, what meanest thou, O sleeper? Why, why are you doing this? We're all scared for our lives. And these were sailors. This wasn't some gentle storm that they'd seen before. They knew that the ferocity of this storm could have only come by the hand of God. That's why they were so panicked. That's why they immediately went to a spiritual reason. They didn't just think, wow, this is a terrible storm. We must have sailed out in the middle of a hurricane. Well, I checked the weather channel this morning. It wasn't supposed to do this. No, they turned immediately to a spiritual cause. He said, oh, call every man upon his God. Whose fault is this? He says, I'm a Hebrew, I serve the living God. And they said, why have you done this to us? So they trust him up. They didn't want to, they tried their best for him, but they finally tied him up and threw him into the, threw him into the sea. Um, and um, and the, the great fish came and got him. So actually, if you turn over to page number three, I'm gonna leave you uh, the, the lesson there, and, and, and you can read through the first page there some of the notes, the different things that God has said um, about this. But let's just look through the uh, uh, outline here. First of all, there was the disobedience of Jonah. We talked about that. And many Christians are like Jonah. When it's convenient to obey God, they obey, but if it's inconvenient to, cho to obey God or un unwelcome God's command, sometimes we choose to disobey. So you see the disobedience of Jonah in verses 1 through 3, but you also see the providence of God. Now, it, this book is about the providence of God, how God loves the world. Now, we believe that verse. We, you know, there was a guy that used to run around football games and stuff like that and put John 3.16 in front of cameras. Remember that? I don't know if he's still alive or not. Does anybody know? I haven't heard of him for years, but, well, that was the thing. You couldn't turn on and watch a sporting event without seeing some guy holding John 3.16 up. And he comes a little, huh? Yeah, always in the end zone or somewhere. He knew where the cameras were going to be looking. And he, he had studied it. He knew where the cameras were going to be, and he was always standing there with the John 3.16 sign. He, he might have passed away. It's been years since I've seen or thought of that guy. But anyway, so God so loved the Christians? The nice people? No, the world. He loved Nineveh. You say, you say Nineveh? It was a wicked, wicked pagan city. I mean, I would say go listen to Dan Carlin's show on the history of Nineveh, 
but it will actually turn your stomach how wicked they were, how pagan they were. I mean, they took it to the next level. They were scary, but God still loved them. He tells us about that in the book of Jonah. We'll get there. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. So he, and so Jonah disobeys, but God loved the world, and God made it so that he could deal with Jonah and still get to Nineveh on time. Now, see, you see, um, God, he, he puts Jonah, he puts him through a course of study at Whale University. Uh, Jonah learns his lessons well. Jonah makes a several-day journey in record time. He runs into the book of Nineveh and preaches the worst message that any Baptist preacher has ever preached in the history of the world. Eight, eight words. What are they? Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I think I've got that right. Eight words. And I mean, he's coming in there and the, the, the gastric juices of the, of the fish probably bleached out his face and his skin. He might have some seaweed still in his hair. I'm sure he looked a beautiful sight. He had just run miles to get there, and he preaches this message, and what happened? The people of Nineveh repented. They repented. And God said, and Jonah, he still had a terrible attitude about it. You see him in uh, the... You, you, he, uh, you see him in uh, verse 5, that, so the people of Nineveh re re believed God in verse 5 of chapter 3. But then you see him sitting outside the city in chapter 4. Why is Jonah sitting outside the city? He's sitting there waiting for Nineveh to be destroyed and is disappointed when they're not. But God tells him in verse number 11 of chapter 4, And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein there are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle. He, God says, Jonah, you're so mad about this gourd that was my providence anyway, and then you were mad that it was gone. Now you're mad that I'm not going to destroy this city. Shouldn't I spare Nineveh? There's, there's children there so young they don't know which hand is which. There's animals there that are just animals. I mean, I know that we have dominion over animals, but that doesn't mean that we have the right to be cruel to them. I mean, that's not right either. We're supposed to be good stewards. God says, should I destroy Nineveh? Where there's so many, not only are there the souls of the people who can tell their right hand from the left, there's also children there. There's all these people. You want me to destroy this whole city because you don't like them. And God says, that's not my way. I came because I love the world. I sent you so they would repent and maybe find the Lord. So the book of, Gen uh, the book of Jonah. Let's, uh, here on this last page, uh, number 10 there, Proverbs 16, verse 33. That lot is cast into his lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. The Lord saw to it that the lot fell upon Jonah. God was in this, God used this, but that does not mean that God approved of it. Now, just because God allowed the lot to fall, either rolling dice or whatever they was, God allowed it to point out to these lost men that Jonah was their problem on the ship. Um, the, uh, and, and that's how they knew. But they actually, and look, turn back to, uh, let's see, after they threw um, verse, uh, chapter number 1, while the lot was cast upon, they took up, in verse 15, they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. The sea ceased from a raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. So even in, Noah's, in Jonah's disobedience, and if I've said Noah at any point during this lesson, uh, just know I meant Jonah. Um, yeah, Jonah and the ark, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, the... Uh, 
But even so, even his disobedience caused these sailors who might never have heard about God to suddenly be interested in God, so much so that they made vows and made sacrifices. Now, I don't know if they followed up on it. I'm not saying they got saved. I'm just saying that, that, they, that, they, that they at least heard about God. They made sacrifices and made vows. Um, the Lord doesn't approve of gambling, nonetheless, just as, just as the Lord didn't really want a worldly beauty contest to pick Esther as queen, but God allowed that to be done so that he could use it. Now, uh, the, the outline is the prodigal prophet, the praying prophet, the preaching prophet, and the pouting prophet. You can look at that in each of those. The prodigal prophet, he ran away, but God brought him back. When he's in the fish's belly, he, he prayed cried out, and the Lord caused the, 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 uh, the, the fish to spit him up on dry land. Then he goes in, he preaches in chapter 3, and then he ends up pouting in chapter 4. Short little book, the book of Jonah, and there's a lot in it. There's a lot of spiritual truths here. So, how can we apply this? We have just a minute or two left. How can we apply this? First of all, when God tells us to do something, we have to do things God's way. We can't go an opposite way. We can't do our own thing. God doesn't, we, we are not in the legislative section of uh, Christian, the Christian walk. You know what I mean? We don't get to make our own rules. We get to implement what God has told us to do. We're executive in that way. We ex execute God's rules. We are uh, God's so when God tells us to do something, even if it's something that we don't understand, even if it's something that we don't want to do, we still have to do it. We still have to do it because it's God's order. Now look what happened to Jonah. Jonah disobeyed. didn't work out well for here. Second of all, and I think this is kind of important, if anybody would have seemed the least likely to turn to God and repent, it would have been the city of Nineveh. If there was anybody on the face of the earth that seemed unlikely to repent and turn to God, it was the Ninevites. Yet God sent them a prophet. He sent them a preacher. And they repented. Now, Brother Fluke over here, he works in Reformers Unanimous. I've been in Addictions Recovery Ministries too. And the reality is, if Jesus Christ... And I told people this a lot of times in Springfield. I told you the bad street in Springfield was Commercial Street. Uh, you know, the people that are whole, they don't need a physician. The people that are sick need a physician. If Jesus Christ, and I'll just pick on Springfield, came to Springfield today, if he was in Springfield today, he wouldn't go to the John Q. Hammonds, uh, you know, regional golf course where they have all the golf course tournaments and all the nice $3 million houses, which is a lot of money for Springfield. Not much money for here, but it's a lot of money for Springfield. But he'd go to Commercial Street where people knew they needed him. The people who are whole don't need a physician. If you think you've got this under control, you don't need a physician. The people who realize they're sick, they're the ones that need God. So if Jesus, the idea of us turning our nose up at somebody like the Ninevites, well, they'll never get saved. Mm -mm. You don't know. You don't know. You know, Jesus or God sent Jonah to this wicked city, and they repented. What might God do with your neighbor? Well, my neighbor never goes to church. So, that doesn't mean we don't need to give him the gospel. Our job is to carry the gospel. The results are up to God, not us. We have one duty to do, spread the gospel, and that's what Jonah was supposed to do. And he got corrected. God got his attention. God can get our attention, too. I hope it doesn't take a big fish, but God can get our attention, and he often does. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the book of Jonah. Lord, just hurried through. Father, there's so much in it, and, and uh, Father, I just pray that you would just bless us, bless our understanding. Lord, take us into the after service and just be with us. Help us as we study the book of John, Lord, and just, let, just bless these folks. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Now, I do think that there are donuts in there, so don't forget. <laughs> Don't be back in here with powdered sugar all over your face.